having been associated with our presenter for as much as 15 years, I reckon, I've learned one thing and one thing for sure. The less of me and the more of Simon is always better. <laughs> it gives me enormous personal pleasure uh, to introduce my Javier Simon. Many of my friends at North Shore Temple Emmanuel will recall Simon's outstanding contribution to our shul community, both in our supplementary school and most especially when serving as our meturgeman on Shabbat, that is, providing a wide-ranging, exceedingly agile and diverse running commentary to the Torah portion, which was incredible and um, so well received. Simon is a more and a mensch. And since we first came to know one another, he's become a husband and a father and a greatly respected educator in the field of Holocaust education. And following six years at the Sydney Jewish Museum is now the head of education at the Melbourne Holocaust Museum. So Simon and I just keep following one another around. <laughs> Simon is my teacher and friend, a fine scholar, and perhaps above all, a deeply engaged Jew. And if I may, not an Orthodox Jew, not a progressive Jew, not a Masorti Jew, but a serious Jew and a scholar of very, very high rank. If you are amongst my friends in Melbourne, and you have yet to join Simon in the classroom at TBI? Shame. <laughs> but Simon's assured me that he'll continue to offer classes at Temple Beth Israel next year. And if uh, we can organize it such that it's on Zoom and you're comfortable doing so, we'd hope that those from around the region will elect to learn with, with Simon. So please put your hands together and welcome him to this afternoon's session. Oy vey. Um, <laughs> thank you very much, Rabbi, for such a, a, a very warm and exceedingly generous introduction. I'm a little bit scared to start speaking and disabuse you of all of the wonderful things that, um, that Rabbi Gary has, um, has just said. Um, Thank you very much, Oli. Um, I'm going to be speaking a little bit today about Holocaust education in the 21st century. And I'd like, I'd like our focus really at the end of, of our session today to be on the directions in which Holocaust education is moving. But for most of this presentation, we're going to be taking a little bit of a retrospective. If we want to get a little bit of a sense as to the directions in th which things are moving, we need to get a, a, a general understanding of the trajectory that we are on. And to do that, what I'm actually going to do, oops, is turn this on. There we go. What I'm actually going to do is uh, giving us a little bit of a timeline over here. I'd like us to really cast our minds back. And um, over the course of this session, what we're going to be doing is going decade by decade, looking at the various trends in both Holocaust research and Holocaust education, which is something very much tied to the research that was taking place, to get a little bit of a sense as to how things are changing and, and really understand where we are today and the directions in which different museums around the world are moving. And to do this, we're actually going to start by going back really to the period of the Holocaust itself, because already the first reports about what is transpiring there are coming out in the 1930s and in the early 1940s. And this is a period that might be characterized as one of intimate knowledge, but a lack of perspective. Here's a tremendous amount of detail that is coming out of uh, Germany and subsequently sites of occupation, but there isn't yet the perspective of time. So in the 1930s, for example, we have reports that are coming from German immigrants who are fleeing the country. We have letters that are coming out of Germany and in some instances coming out of uh, concentration camps themselves, some of which go into a tremendous amount of, uh, of detail. Um, the, the purpose of this information is to encourage some kind of action. 
Okay, so it's obviously it's too soon to be encouraging memorialization or even education, but it's for the purposes of encouraging diplomatic action, uh, boycotts, uh, protests, encouraging different countries to, to drop their uh, various entry restrictions and to allow a greater influx of refugees. And we see the same thing in the early 1940s. In the 1940s, again, incredible detail coming directly from sites of violence and occupation, but in, a, in addition to encouraging diplomatic action, it's now also encouraging military action. Because I don't want to spend too much time on this particular early period of the history, I'll be fairly brief, but I'll just give a couple of very short examples. Some of you might be familiar, of course, with the work of uh, Dr. Emanuel Ringelblum, who was murdered in Warsaw in 1944 but who presided prior to that period of time over a secret archive within the Warsaw Ghetto. And was he, he was not only amassing information, but he was painstakingly copying that information and smuggling it out to connections in the Polish underground who were ferrying it to the Polish government in exile in London, who were enabling it to be broadcast on the BBC. So if you sort of imagine this scene, 26th of June 1942, according to his diary, he's sitting and covertly listening to a radio broadcast on the BBC relating to materials that he had helped to smuggle out of the ghetto. So the people are learning about violence in places like Vilna and Slonim and Lemberg, which is Lvov, uh, and Chelmno. And this image over here is from the Verba Wetzler report. Some of you might have seen the Auschwitz report, which is currently playing at uh, the Jewish International Film Festival. Uh, and this is one aspect of that Auschwitz report put together by two Slovak escapees uh, from Auschwitz-Birkenau. And that information was also making its way to various other governments and, and being reported upon uh, by, by you know, people like uh, Winston Churchill and Franklin D. Roosevelt and the Pope and is one of the reasons as to why the Hungarian government, at least for a period of time, put a hold on all transports of Jews out of Budapest and is the reason as to why diplomatic action increases in Hungary. And we have diplomats like Raoul Wallenberg, for example, who are helping more Jews directly on the ground. So this type of information has a, has a, has a direct consequence. And I mention it only because we need to appreciate that even in this early period, there is this intimate information that is coming out of these sites of occupation, out of these camps, and out of these um, uh, places where the violence is being perpetrated, all of which is leading to a general sense amongst the Jewish world at the time that there is this tremendous destruction and, and it's the end of an era. So we see in the early 40s, for example, the beginnings of this desire to memorialize those communities that are lost. The first Yizko book, the first memorial book, was published in New York in 1943 and was for Lodge. And over time, there would be some 900 different Yizko Bircher, different memorial books that would be published, most of which over the course of time would be in Hebrew and published in the State of Israel, but many of which would be written in Yiddish. Once the war ends, there is this call to get survivors writing down their experiences, sharing their experiences. I just wanted to share one particular example of this because it's quite a visually striking poster. And this is from 1947 to 1948. As you can see at the bottom, it's issued by the Central Historical Commission of the Central Committee of Liberated Jews in the American Zone of Occupation in Germany, encouraging people to transcribe and record. And it's framed here as a religious obligation. Okay, we have this quote here from the Torah, Zachor et Asher Salacha Amalek, that you have this relig religious obligation to remember what Amalek did to you. And it's even put on a level, what survivors are recording is put on a level with the recording of other great catastrophes that have occurred in Jewish history, such as the exodus from Egypt, or the, the big pan, the slavery in Egypt, and we've got the Haggadah, the destruction of the temple, and we have the Book of Lamentations, the Book of Eicha. We've also got the expulsion from Spain and the, um, the, the Chmielnitsky massacres and various examples of medieval compositions that have memorialized those events as well. And now we are calling upon you, the survivors, to record the experiences that you yourself had. And one of the first people, by the way, who is recording these experiences as early as 1946 is David Boda. He spoke a variety of different languages, was able to interview people in a number of different uh, languages. And the title that he gave to his collected interviews, I think, is quite telling. He's interviewed a lot of survivors, but he did not interview the dead. There is this perspective that... The survivors of the Holocaust, by virtue of the fact that they survived, their experiences were to some degree not representative of the genocide that they had, for want of a better word, escaped. That if we really want to understand the Holocaust, we need to engage with the experiences of those people who perished. 
Now, at this early point in time, and this is not just in the immediate aftermath of the war, but during the 1950s as well, Jewish researchers like David Berta, very interested in acquiring a lot of documentation relating to survivors. But outside of the Jewish world, most of the documentation that is being amassed is being amassed about individuals like the men that we see here. And it's being amassed for these sorts of purposes, for the purposes of putting on trial major war criminals. In fact, it's probably fair to say that there's a little bit of a distinction, a di differentiation between the types of information that's being recorded. Documents written by victims and written by survivors, they're going into memorial books, Yizko Bicha, and into ceremonies. Information that's going into um, the courtroom is overwhelmingly German in substance. Okay, it's mainly focused on perpetrators. And so far as historians at this time are concerned, that's really their focus in the 1950s as well. Okay, they're mostly interested in how the Holocaust happened. All of these other considerations are viewed as, to a large degree, byproducts of the decisions that are made by perpetrators. And I'll share with you just one a, a classic example, being the doyen of uh, Holocaust studies, Raoul Hilberg, whose work that he researched throughout the 1950s was published in 1961 as The Destruction of the European Jews. And his focus there also is very much on perpetration, the decisions that are made by the perpetrators themselves rather than the responses of, uh, of Jewish communities. So what about Holocaust education? Yeah, this is all the information that is coming into the world. This is the material that historians are putting together. What kind of information is then being presented to the general public? And in the 1950s, we actually see a variety of new institutions taking shape. So in Israel, for example, we have the Ghetto Fighters House, which was established in 1949. Fairly shortly afterwards, Yad Vashem is established in 1953. And between the two, we have Yom HaShoah, which is established in 1951. And there's a bit of a trend here, as you may have noticed, people who are familiar with, um, with these two institutions may recognize as well, that there's a real focus here on resistance. And this is a new sort of historiographical trend in Israel in particular on the nature of resistance. In fact, what we refer to as Yom HaShoah was more fully referred to as Yom HaZikaron LaShoah V'Lagvura. It was the day of remembrance for the Holocaust and for the resistance and for the strength. And in fact, the date that was chosen for Yom HaShoah, the date that was settled on, I should say, is the 27th of Nisan, but the date that was chosen originally before it needed to be moved for religious reasons corresponded with the beginning of the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And this is very much a focus in Israel at the, in the 1950s. In the United States, no real focus on the Holocaust at all. And that's largely because of the Cold War. So the United States is allied with West Germany at the time and airing German crimes seems contrary to the general agenda. There's not a lot of discussion in public spaces as regards the genocide that the Germans were responsible for perpetrating against the Jews throughout, um, throughout all of German-occupied Europe. This changes in the 1960s, as I'll get to in, um, in a moment, because in the 1960s, the Holocaust becomes a university subject. That itself is a major change. All of a sudden, you have this younger generation of scholars who are interested in engaging firsthand with materials and with all materials. Then they're a little bit less selective already as regards the kinds of things that they are focusing on. As a result of this, there are research institutions that begin systematically interviewing survivors. It becomes, once again, a systematic focus in the 1960s of recording fresh the experiences that survivors had during those years of occupation and terror. There is a shift of interest, as one would appreciate, from the persecution of Jews to the responses of Jewish communities during persecution. Okay, how did Jews respond? And that allows for a broadening of our understanding of resistance. Up until this point in time, resistance has been uh, associated with ghetto uprisings and camp uprisings. Yehuda Bauer proposes the use of Amidah. Amidah just means standing up. Okay, any form of resistance, be it physical or non-physical, constitutes Amidah. While another scholar by the name of Shaul Ul Esh proposes the use of Kiddush HaChaim. Kiddush HaChaim means the sanctification of life. 
He didn't invent that term, by the way. That term was invented by Rabbi Yitzchak Nissenbaum, who was murdered in the Warsaw Ghetto, but who used that phrase during the war years to, to create a contrast with what we normally refer to as Kiddush Hashem. Kiddush Hashem, which is the sanctification of the name of God, is a way of referring to martyrdom. A person who accepts death, traditionally, a person who accepts death rather than committing a certain type of transgression. But he argued under these circumstances that we are facing at the moment, Kiddush Hashem could actually result in a person's survival. Nowadays, this type of what Shaul Esh is talking about when he uses the phrase Kiddush Hashem, we would refer to as spiritual resistance, okay, or cultural resistance. People who find ways of covertly educating children within ghettos, uh, for example, uh, secretly teaching Torah, uh, or secretly engaging to some degree in the traditions and the laws uh, that are, that are uh, uh, dictated by their faith. In the 1960s in general, we have an increased interest in survivors. So the, the decade is framed to some degree in that, in that respect. In 1960, Elie Wiesel publishes Night. It wasn't the first Holocaust memoir to be published, but it, but it was accompanied with a tremendous and unprecedented degree of uh, literary and critical attention. Uh, it was a big, a big sort of a literary phenomenon, the publication of, um, of Night. And towards the end of the decade in 1967, there is the Six Day War. And the Six Day War also contributed to a changing perception of Jews within general society. This, this notion that Jews are fundamentally passive, that Jews might, to use that famous quote, go like lambs to the slaughter, is challenged with a conception of Jews as people who are prepared to fight and fight well and effectively. And that also contributes to this change in focus. But while there's an increase in attention on survivors in the 60s, there is also an increased attention on perpetrators. So in 1961, Eichmann is arrested, he's brought to Jerusalem, uh, and he is tried in a Jerusalem court. And I will say, by the way, that survivors are very much related to this as well, because this is now the first major trial of a Nazi war criminal where, where there is a real focus on survivors giving testimony. Okay? And it was actually one of the people who worked with Emanuel Ringelblum, whose name was Rochel Auerbach, who was really instrumental in, um, in that shift in focus in appreciating that survivors have a story that needs to be heard in the courtroom. Throughout the 1960s as well, because West Germany had a statute of limitations and there was a concern that they will not be able to prosecute people if they wait too long, there is a spate of further trials. Okay, trials of people like Franz Stangl, for example, who was the commandant of Zobibor, and then of Treblinka, of Josef Oberhauser, who was deputy commandant of Belzec. These were all people who held positions of authority within the, the, the extermination camp system. They are now being put in the courtroom. And if the verdict and the, 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 uh, the consequences of their trials, so what am I thinking, the sentence, maybe doesn't match up to what we might think these individuals deserved, there is at least a broadening recognition of the nature of their crimes. There is a growing understanding of the sorts of things of which they were responsible. We move into the 1970s. And in the 1970s, there's a number of archives that are opening up in other countries, and it's allowing for an increased attention as to what different countries knew, particularly the United States. There's a lot of interest in what the United States knew during the Holocaust and the various rescue efforts that different people engaged in. And as a result of all of these new archives, there are highly illuminating studies into areas of research that had previously been unexplored like the railway system, the transformation of non-Nazi policemen into mass murderers, the role of the German army, which previously had generally been thought to have not been involved in the perpetration of these particular crimes, and that's being reassessed, uh, and the attitudes of regular Germans. And the Holocaust, of course, enters the general kind of cultural sphere in the United States towards the end of the decade with a four-part NBC miniseries starring James Woods and Meryl Streep. And there's much about this miniseries from a historical perspective that can be criticised, but by bringing it into the conversation, by allowing for a broadened conversation around the Holocaust and by casting actors that are familiar to people, it helped contribute to that sense that the, 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 the Holocaust really flowed into the world in which we live in today. The idea that there was this shift, uh, uh, that there was a lack of continuity begins to fade. 
to put this in just very kind of crass terms, the Holocaust was not a different planet. Okay, and there's an increased sort of understanding in the 1970s um, as to that fact. In the 1980s, there is further attention to Jewish society, not even for the purposes of looking at resistance, but just wanting to understand the nature of religious society, the nature of youth movements. There are further interviews being conducted, and there's a real flourishing of memoirs. And so far as Holocaust research is concerned, this is a big decade. And there's a lot of conflict between historians because there's a growing awareness that the Holocaust did not develop in a linear fashion. Certain things that previously historians thought they understood, they're now being challenged. So things like the genesis of the final solution, the nature of Hitler's role in decision making, the degree to which the genocide had even been foreseen. And there's a British academic at the time, a British historian by the name of Timothy Mason, who in 1981 coins this distinction. Some of you might be familiar with this distinction between intentionalism and functionalism. So in a, in a very um, sort of exaggerated terms, an intentionalist would argue that it had been Hitler's intention from the outset to commit this genocide, and there's hints of it even in Mein Kampf, which he's writing in the middle of the 1920s. While an extreme functionalist perspective would suggest that it had never been planned, it had never been foreseen, but the Holocaust arose as the variety of decisions that are made in the moment because of exigencies in the moment, changing circumstances, obviously, there's, to adopt one position over the other, it's quite extreme. Historians really fall somewhere between the two, and his phrasing of that distinction helps us understand the kinds of debates that historians are having at this time. But another big debate that happens at this time towards the end of the 1980s is the historic Australia. Conrad in the audience will hopefully correct my terrible pronunciation of the German, this historian's battle. Perfect, oh, very good. Um, in Germany, there's this debate between the degree to which the Holocaust might be seen as a distinctly German crime. German society, because of its adoration for the Kaiser, had always been moving towards some kind of totalitarian regime. And because of this ingrained anti-Semitism, it was to some degree almost perhaps inevitable. And the idea to which it was not really a distinctly German crime, but the circumstances were such that in Germany at that time, the, the, the time was optimum for, for, for an event of this nature, and then how does one integrate it into German history? So far as Holocaust education is concerned, as Rabbi Gary mentioned, I come from the Melbourne Holocaust Museum, and, and the Melbourne Holocaust Museum opened in 1984. So in the midst of all of these debates that are taking place amongst uh, historians, how best to understand the Holocaust, in Australia, we opened the first Holocaust Museum. At the time, it was called the Jewish Holocaust Centre. Uh, the Jewish Holocaust Museum and Research Centre was the full title. And I thought I'd share just this uh, photograph that was taken on the day of the museum's opening, because I think it's quite a striking and provocative uh, image. And you can see there, um, uh, behind Bono Wiener, who was um, one of the founders of the museum, a survivor of the, the uh, uh, Lodge Ghetto, you can see behind him uh, on the wall a phrase, uh, in fact, it's three different phrases in three different languages. So in the Yiddish, you've got, we will not forgive, we will, I beg your pardon, we will not forget, we will not forgive. Uh, in the Hebrew underneath, that biblical uh, quote that I shared with you a moment ago, remember what Amalek did to you. And beneath that, in English, the injunction to remember the six million Jews. But the big decade for Holocaust research is the one that I want to spend a little bit more time on, and it's the 90s. There is a major geopolitical change that occurs in the 90s. Up until the 90s, the Soviet Union is ruling over a large swathe of Eastern Europe. And of course, that all changes. And with that change, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, aside from the fact that some 15 different countries newly come into existence, information preserved within those countries becomes accessible to scholars of the West. All of a sudden, Western historians are able to begin accessing documentation that had previously lain behind the Iron Curtain. And I want to share just some statistics with you that you might find surprising. I certainly found very surprising myself when I first encountered this. But this newly accessed documentation runs for hundreds of kilometers, we're one to lay it out end to end, and some hundreds of millions of pages. 
I had the great uh, honor of very recently speaking with Sarah Bloomfield, who's the director of the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum. And if I remember correctly, the detail that she gave me, in the Ukraine alone, it's some 18 million documents. Now, obviously, this is more than any one person in a lifetime could engage with. I think it's, any, it's more than any one research institution can conceivably engage with. So this is really laying the, the, the foundations for something of a revolution in the way in which people are understanding the Holocaust. And the nature of this documentation that runs for these hundreds of kilometers, is comprised of documents that were left behind by retreating Germans. It's records of post-war trials of Germans and also people who stood accused, sometimes falsely, of being collaborators with the Germans. It's materials related to special Soviet inquiries into the nature of German crimes. And then personal documentation, which I find fascinating, speaking for myself. Um, letters that people are sending and receiving, postcards that they are sending and receiving, and a voluminous amount of photographic documentation. A lot of people, it turns out, had personal photograph collections. And all of these sorts of materials, they start to become available for Western historians to engage in. And there's consequences to what they are encountering. And I want to focus on three. And the first one, the first uh, outcome of this, is really just in the realm of Holocaust um, uh, research, you might say. So I mentioned to you before this uh, dichotomy that was coined in 1981 between intentionalism and functionalism. As a result of this information, there is now a new dichotomy, center versus periphery. To what degree were decisions made in Berlin? And to what degree were decisions made in other areas uh, of occupation throughout Eastern Europe? And these two dichotomies really relate to one another because they relate to this notion as to the degree to which the Holocaust had been foreseen. And I'll share with you as well a couple of books that were published in the 90s that re-inflamed a lot of these debates, not only in terms of intentionalism and functionalism, but also in terms of the place of the Holocaust in, in German history. In 1992, Christopher Browning published Ordinary Men, which was a study into the men of Reserve Police Battalion 101. And in 1996, Daniel Jonah Goldhagen published Hitler's Willing Executioners, which was a study of the men in Reserve Police Battalion 101. And the fact that these two scholars came to vastly different conclusions reignited to some degree a lot of those old discussions, a lot of those old debates, I'm calling them old, but from the vantage point of the mid 90s, I suppose it's not really so old, as regards the place of the Holocaust within German history, the degree to which the Holocaust had been foreseen, and the nature of decision making during the Holocaust as well. That's the first big outcome. The second big outcome has to do with information about local collaborators. And I'm not talking about pro-Nazi fanatics, I'm talking about broad swathes of the population the degree to which members of the general population within these countries that had been now a part of the Soviet Union for so many years, the degree to which they were complicit in these crimes, the degree to which they were actually committing these crimes themselves. So information in this regard comes in the forms of letters that they sent to one another, indictments that were handed down by local courts where they stood accused of collaboration with the Germans, and in personal collections of photographs. And there's a remarkable, remarkable book. It's a very graphic book, I will warn you, but it is a really incredible book written by Wendy Lauer titled The Ravine um, that, um, that aside from its highly graphic nature, I have to say I, I, I enjoyed this book very much, if that's the right um, uh, verb to use uh, in relation to a text of this nature. But she investigates a photograph that was taken by a man who had been accused of being a collaborator. And she argues falsely that his taking of this photograph, and here's a photo of him, by the way, is this uh, gentleman in the middle, um, who was a Slovak security guard. His taking of the photograph, she argued, was part of a general act of resistance on his part. Um, but his having stood accused um, allowed for you know, this sort of information to come to light and to come into the courts and so forth, and she uh, laid against access to this, um, to this photograph herself that she analyzes. And there's a number of trials that are now taking place of people's standing accused as collaborators. 
and, uh, and I'll mention one of these trials, actually, um, which was the trial of Ivan Polyakovich, um, Conrad Quitt, um, the, um, the historian in residence at the Sydney Jewish Museum, um, who's um, sitting in the back of the room, was the, um, was the chief historian uh, during, this, um, during this trial, where uh, uh, not just as a historian, but also uh, forensic archaeologists were sent to Serniki in the Ukraine uh, in order to, um, to seek to uncover information related to the crimes for which Ivan Polyakovich stood accused. Uh, and, uh, and just a little bit of a shout out to the Sydney Jewish Museum. Anybody who goes and visits the Sydney Jewish Museum will actually see some of the objects there on display that were recovered by these forensic archaeologists, which is a truly a, a remarkable thing. And the quote that I'm including here is from an Australian journalist by the name of Mark Ahrens, who, um, who initiated this whole proceeding by publishing a book, um, uh, uh, Bigger pardon. The book that he published was in 2001, but the book is based on, on, on research that he'd done earlier. The book was titled uh, War Criminals Welcome, but he was responsible for really kind of blowing the lid off this, um, this business by which many Nazi war criminals and people who had collaborated with the Nazis were welcomed into Australia, and the degree to which ASIO, for example, knew of their former crimes. But given the fact that their anti-Soviet credentials were impeccable, they were allowed into, uh, into Australia. So Ivan Polyakovich is one of a number of different people who in the years since then, as a result of increasing information about local collaboration, have, um, have stood accused. Uh, and, uh, and I will say as well, by the way, as I'm sure people are all, all aware, this is very controversial. One of the reasons this is very controversial is that these newly independent Eastern European countries they're fiercely nationalistic. And they actually exhibit strains of the same chauvinist nationalism and anti-Semitism as their forebears. So in some of these countries, such as to varying degrees in the Baltic states, in the Ukraine, in Romania, in Hungary, in those that came into existence with the disintegration of Yugoslavia and in Poland, there's very much been this desire to downplay collaboration and to emphasize resistance. This is a big issue at the moment in Poland, as I'm sure people are aware. A historian in Poland can actually face prison time if they were to say things about Poland's role during the Holocaust that run contrary to what the government in Poland is insisting is, is the general consensus, okay, is, what, is what we should be saying about the Polish people rather than heaping scorn upon them by pointing out the amount of collaboration that, um, that also transpired. And I'll give you just one example because it's quite a recent example. In December of 2021, the Belarusian parliament stipulated that they will not divide by ethnic origin the blood spilt by the Nazis. And as a result of this, the Holocaust in Belarus actually just becomes a part of the general genocide of the Belarusian people. This is a very contentious issue at the moment. This is December 2021, okay? So this is quite, um, quite a recent thing. It's something that is happening now. It's to do with the nature of memory and how memory is best preserved in these different countries. And I'll come back to this point in a moment, actually. But I want to mention the third big outcome, okay? So we have this new dichotomy. We have an increased awareness as to the amount of local collaboration. And we have also an increased understanding of the degree to which Auschwitz was not the primary locus of the Holocaust. So Auschwitz was the primary uh, destination for Jews throughout Western and Central Europe. And as a result of this, images relating to Auschwitz have long served almost as metaphors for the Holocaust itself. Okay, so you'll appreciate these are actually two different camps. Here we have the entrance to Auschwitz-Birkenau, which is Auschwitz number two. Here we have the entrance to Auschwitz number one, which is the concentration camp. It's to Auschwitz two that Jews are sent. And, and largely, depending on where they are coming from, by closed cattle wagons, which also begins to serve as this sort of metaphor for the Holocaust itself. And a lot of this information that is coming to light in the 90s is challenging this conception of Auschwitz as the primary site. It's one of a number of primary sites. Now, other sites had been known about. I don't mean to suggest to you, for example, that Belzec, Sobibor, and Treblinka, people are only learning about those in the 90s. That's not the case. Information had been known about these sites, but there is now increased information about these other types of killing centers, uh, places like Mali Trostinets, uh, for example, uh, and Yasinovets. Uh, and, uh, and in addition, there's an increased understanding as to the number of people who are actually murdered within a short walking distance from their homes. 
somewhat more than the number of people concerning whom it had been previously assumed. I'll share with you an example, actually, of a testimony that, um, that was recorded in the aftermath of the war with the Soviet court. This is Friedrich Jekyll, who was an Einsatzgruppen leader. And he testified in 1945, this is shortly prior to his execution, he testified that in the Baltic East, the number of Jews who had been murdered was between 190 and 250,000. It's very large numbers, but large enough that I think we need to take note of the fact he's lost count of 60,000 people. And there is a man by the name of Father Patrick Desbois. Some people might be familiar with him. He coined the phrase Holocaust by bullets. And, uh, and he um, runs an organization which is called Yachad in Unum. Okay. In Unum, in Latin, is together, like Yachad in, um, in Hebrew. This is from their webpage. I've included the, the URL there at the bottom of the page. And you can see there's close to 2,000 different documented execution sites uh, and over 1,000 other sites that are available for, uh, for consultation and okay, for investigation. And you can see geographically where they are located. Okay, with the exception of a handful in Slovakia, we are looking at eastern Poland and further to the east. So there is more information that is coming to light in the 90s as a result of the, the, the widespread nature of these types of campaigns. So how is this conveyed then to the public? If we're thinking about the nature of Holocaust education, there are committees established throughout Europe, including in Eastern Europe, that have the aim of providing compensation to Jews. This is material compensation that we're talking about. And as a result of these committees, new information is amassed regarding the degree to which local populations were complicit in the robbing of Jews. And in order to get this done, funding is allocated to these committees and to these archives for the purposes of research, and the funding is conditional on those scholars engaging with their local populations in education campaigns, making sure that the local populations of Lithuania, for example, and Ukraine and Latvia have a general awareness as to the degree to which their populations had been also complicit with these crimes. This is a very, very big, by the way, if we're thinking about popular culture, a very big event that occurs also in the beginning of the 90s, far bigger than the four-part NBC miniseries, which was you know, spectacular in its own right. Um, but that is, of course, Schindler's List, which wins Best Picture at the 66th Academy Awards. And being a major motion picture, Steven Spielberg, there's a huge budget, uh, that, that brings to a very broad audience a lot of these different themes. And as people may be aware as well, uh, Spielberg uses the proceeds of this film to establish the survivors of the Shoah Visual History Foundation, which is now the USC, the University of Southern California Shoah Foundation. And that enables people as volunteers around the world to receive the funding necessary for interviewing survivors again. We have another uh, sort of a, a wave of survivor uh, interviews that's occurring now in the middle of the 90s. People who had perhaps never actually shared their stories before, for all manner of different reasons, may not have felt that their story was necessarily worth sharing. And now for the first time, speaking with interviewers and on film, sharing the experiences that they had during uh, the Second World War. Sorry, begging your pardon, that was my phone. I have it on because I don't have a watch. I don't want to speak for too long. Um, so um, if we're thinking about Holocaust education here in Australia, the 90s is also a period during which there is a, a, a growth in, um, in museum engagement. So we have the Holocaust Institute of Western Australia established in 1990. We have the Sydney Jewish Museum, which is established in 1993. And in the United States, we have the USHMM, which is also established in 1993, although development of that museum had been in, continuing since the 1970s. And they were very much, by the way, behind that allocation of funding to these archives in Eastern Europe and making that funding conditional on, um, on engagement with, um, with the local population. So let's move now more into the present day getting a sense of this trajectory. We have in 1998, the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance, IRA, is established to strengthen, advance, and promote Holocaust education, remembrance, and research worldwide. 
and in 2010, the European Holocaust Research Inf Infrastructure is established to support the European Holocaust Research Community and to help initiate new levels of collaborative research so that we can have historians with their engagement in these different archives not working in isolation but actually m engaging with, uh, with one another and fostering a greater degree of collegiality as regards the sharing of uh, information uh, and so forth. And of course between these two, we have the United Nations declaring International Holocaust Remembrance Day. And given what I've just told you as regards the, the shifting of focus away from Auschwitz, it's also interesting to note and perhaps ironic to note that the date that is chosen for International Holocaust Remembrance Day is the date of the liberation of Auschwitz in January 27th. So the place of Auschwitz, at least as a metaphor for the Holocaust, continues to some degree to be undisturbed. And as you'll all appreciate, I'm sure everybody knows examples of this phenomenon, um, Auschwitz appearing in titles of books and in articles and as a focus in films uh, and in literature more generally, um, in as much as it represents something about the Holocaust that, that, pe that resonates with people in that, um, in that sort of public sphere. So in terms of the future of Holocaust education, where we started to some degree, and this is where I would like to, um, to finish and think a little bit, having looked at that trajectory that we are on, to think a little bit about what are current trends, okay, what is happening today and what do people want? What are the sorts of things that for people who are seeking some measure of engagement with the Holocaust, what exactly are those people looking for? And I think to a large degree, the current trends include this desire to make the Holocaust immediate. Okay, people, over the last several decades, we've been experiencing as, as, as uh, survivors um, have been passing away, and as there have been fewer people who can share their own personal recollections, at least of certain aspects of the Holocaust that had previously been very much in, in the public eye, there is this desire to, to some degree, to reverse that trend. And we see this desire very much with cinema, for example, if we think about uh, trends in cinema at the moment, uh, there is this kind of hyper-realism. So I mentioned before the Auschwitz report, which is currently playing in cinemas at the moment, is a kind of a, a, a very realistic and deliberately immersive film. And over the last few years, some people might have seen films like Sobibor or My Name is Sarah or Son of Saul, all of which are designed controversially to, to put the viewer in the action, okay? And there is this intention, I think, that a lot of people have this desire to engage on that, in, that, in that manner. But there is also a desire to make the Holocaust universal, to appreciate the fact that while we are speaking of specific crimes, those crimes have a universal application, okay? That when we are talking about a Jewish catastrophe, but its message is relevant to everybody, and if we're thinking about the nature of perpetration, if we want to engage in what it means for an, a regular person, okay, to borrow Christopher Browning's language, an ordinary person, to engage in these crimes, we have to also think beyond Europe. We have to think about human nature more generally. And very much it is a current trend at the moment to take the message of the Holocaust and universalize it in that, uh, in that fashion. And then finally, there is this very strong desire to engage with the experiences of individual survivors. So not just to think of the experiences of um, the people who lived in Piotrkov Tribunalski, but to think of the experiences of a particular person who came from Piotrkov Tribunalski, and to understand a little bit that individual's story. I'll just say, by the way, this is not going to go into this information uh, right now, but, um, but there are remarkable things that are being done at the moment at the Sydney Jewish Museum, and I just I want to uh, point out that Shannon Biederman uh, is going to be speaking a little bit later today. I would very, very much recommend attending her session because the work that the Sydney Jewish Museum is doing in terms of allowing people to engage with the experiences of individual survivors, some of whom have since passed away, I think is absolutely incredible. And although I'm not gonna be really speaking about this now, I did work at the Sydney Jewish Museum for six years, was very much involved in that project. It was an enormous privilege for me, and I think really very much a career highlight to be involved in, um, in the recording of survivors' testimony in this particular way that you will hear Shannon uh, talk about just a little bit later uh, this afternoon.
But what I would like to focus on before I do bring this towards a conclusion and, and, and hopefully have the opportunity to respond to any questions that people have is the work that we're doing at the Melbourne Holocaust Museum. So one of the things that we are doing at the moment is um, partnering with Melbourne University, with psychologists who work at the Centre of Wellbeing Science at Melbourne University to look at ways in which we can use language in presenting information that is conducive to students building various types of character strengths. So building what we're referring to as a learning framework, it's designed to ensure that students and members of the public who are interfacing with us are not encountering a history that is something that gets you down, something that weighs on you, but actually focuses on themes of resilience, on survival and resistance, and that hopefully using language that enables students, school students, to, to reassess their own behaviour and their own prejudices. And this is related very much to this desire to universalise the message of the Holocaust. We are still speaking of a very particular history, but we want the history that we are speaking to be meaningful to people who are not members of the Jewish community who are coming and who are engaging with us. Uh, we don't want them to feel alienated by these experiences, but for them to resonate in a hopefully meaningful and, uh, and constructive way. When those students do engage with us, one of the things that they do is they engage in object handling workshops. And this has to do very much with this desire to make the Holocaust immediate. That in as much as it is still possible, and will, I hope, still be possible for at least another 10 years, to meet a living witness to history, to, to hold an object in one's hands, and we use uh, uh, replicas that have been constructed so that students can engage with, um, with these objects in a tactile sense, but to hold in one's hands um, material survivors of the Holocaust, okay? objects as survivors, in a sense, um, as a way of bridging that gap in time and space between us and, um, and the location of these crimes and to make it more, to make it more immediate. We also have, or I should say in the future tense, we will have, when the museum itself actually opens uh, uh, early next year, uh, we will have something called In the Footsteps that will enable people within the museum space to follow, so to speak, in the footsteps of individual survivors, uh, a way of uh, them being guided through the museum to, to consider, consider the experiences of specific uh, men and women, many of whom have since uh, passed away, and engage a little bit with, um, with their experiences. And then also, in terms of that immediacy and that sort of visceral connection, we have also a VR offering. So this virtual reality. So one of the survivors at the museum, his name is Shai Heskil. Uh, he was a survivor of the Lodge Ghetto and of Auschwitz. There was a film crew that went with him back to the scene of some of these uh, uh, crimes uh, and filmed him using 3D uh, cameras so that we can see him um, outside the home in which he lived, um, uh, speaking with the people who live in that home today, um, going to um, a Radagosh train station um, where he was, from where he was deported, uh, and going through Auschwitz-Birkenau. So using this VR experience without actually being able to go to Auschwitz, uh, one has the ability to see, in a sense, to, to, to engage, in a sense, with that landscape. This is Auschwitz today, of course, as the film was made today. This is not seeking to recreate the history, but allowing for that possibility of virtual tourism, in some sense. So this is another offering that we have at, um, at the museum. So all of this relating very much to these sorts of these key uh, trends, as we might identify, in the, in, in the nature of Holocaust engagement today, that give us a little bit of a sense as to the directions in which we are moving in the future. Um, I am mindful of the fact that in five minutes there is afternoon tea. And I don't want to stand between anybody and their um, tea. Um, but if anybody has any questions uh, that relate to anything um, that I've spoken about, yes. Um, the move towards, um, for younger people possibly, of looking behind the Holocaust to um, 
to people's families and family experiences. So that instead of just, uh, just saying that it starts with the Holocaust, it all started beforehand. These were people who were ordinary people, teachers and, and doctors. And I know Conrad's very familiar with um, Estelle Rosinski's um, uh, films on that. Uh, they're cartoons of just short stories of people's lives before the Holocaust. Yeah. Um, so um, I would like to say two things actually in response to that. So one thing that I would like to say is that yes, in the museum, um, as in other Holocaust museums that I have been to, there is also very much a focus on that world that was component. So getting a little bit of a sense as to the nature of Jewish society in its complexity and its in its diversity prior to the Holocaust. And that, to be honest, I think is, is a subject for an entire museum. I think there's too much there that can really go into one exhibit, but, it, but it's important that it features within the museum to provide some degree of contextualization so that there is an appreciation not only of that diversity, but to some degree, as I think you allude to, that fundamental normality of their lives uh, and, um, and the degree to which, in some instances, they were not at all distinct from the local population. Uh, and to also uh, indicate those instances in which there were distinctions, uh, in which they did comprise uh, uh, Jewish people in different places, did, did make up a, a, a distinct or even visually identifiably distinct uh, community within the societies in which they were a part, but that they were family members and professionals and tradesmen and, 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 and so on and so forth. The other thing I do want to say, and I'll just say this very quickly, because I, do, I realized in the way that you worded your question, something that I did leave off this list uh, that I am very, very excited for actually. I mentioned that the museum will be opening early next year. In the middle of next year, we have a second museum that is opening at uh, the level directly above the museum, which is a museum specifically for younger audiences, so for primary school children. So one of the challenges that we had always faced is when you go into a, a, a museum and you have younger audiences, you know, you're always maybe bodily situating yourself in such a way that they don't see a particular display or advising them not to look over here, not to open this particular drawer. So this kind of does away with that concern that everything is very much age appropriate uh, for, um, for children. Um, but it also enables us to focus on, um, on, on uh, the experiences of seven survivors who survived in hiding and look exactly as you were just suggesting, their lives before the war, their experiences during the war and their lives after the war as well. Simon, I wanna ask you to comment on the impact uh, of the um, March of the Living program. The trajectory of my life was changed profoundly in 1979 when I participated in what was then known as the Journey of Conscience, the second um, such trip in American um, ed Holocaust education history to go to Poland, to go to the sites of the atrocities and to go to Israel. What are we learning about those kids and now adults who've had that experience? Oh, um, that's a wonderful question, and I can't answer it. I, 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 I regret that I don't, I don't know. How many of you, by show of hands, have a child, a grandchild, a student who has made such a trip? Yeah, interesting. The Longitudinal Study out of New York 10 years after the first march took place. And they found um, categorically that there was a very much higher rate of synagogue affiliation amongst those kids and a much higher rate of um, communal involvement. Whether that's been perpetuated, I can't answer, but that's their first study that they did. Thank you, Marian. That's, um, that's very interesting. I appreciate that. Um, I have a lot of hands up, but I think um, Rabbi Gary, who has the mic, is choosing for me. First of all, it was fascinating. Yeah, you're from Israel. So I, I read one of the, the finest books that I've read in the last decade about the Holocaust was an Australian book by someone by the name of Mark Korsum, if I'm not mistaken, the mascot. Um, oh. And, and I, I would suggest that you try to get his story into your museum uh, as someone with a fabulous story. His story is very, very interesting. I'm familiar with, um, with his story, actually. It's quite... Um, it's a fascinating experience. I don't know, it's, it's, some, it's something, the experience that he describes may be somewhat unique even. There is, I've heard similar sorts of stories, but, but none to the degree that, that he describes in, uh, in his book. 
So, and the other, the other comment I'll make is that in Israel right now, there's discussion as to whether um, every high school child in either 11th or 12th grade is given the option to travel to, was, was given the option to travel to Poland, and there's questions as to whether that should continue because of questions of, of ultra-nationalism that comes up during those trips to some degree, and the fact that some of those trips end up not getting doing what they actually were supposed to do. So I think there's a question. I don't know whether that's a, 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 d a dilemma that exists within the March of the Living uh, community. Okay, thank you. Um, what, one, I, I want to take your question, but what, um, um, I just want to make sure that, because uh, there's a few hands over here as well, but yeah, yes, please. Alfred Cruel from Temple David in Perth. I'm just wondering if you have a view of the various Kristallnacht commemoration functions, which seem to be certainly in Western Australia and South Australia to my certain knowledge, and I believe in Victoria and New South Wales as well. These have become uh, the domain of the councils of Christians and Jews in the various states. Do you have a view as to their effectiveness and their I'm not, I'm contribution? Not, I'm, not, I'm not aware of that, I'm sorry. Uh, big, big your pardon. Um, yes. Simon, G'day. can I ask you, um, possibly not on your graph yet, 2022, um, anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism mm -hmm. e equals the same. I wonder if you have a view about whether Holocaust education should, uh, should have a a yeah. social justice directive with, with well, enshrined in museums. The, ev the evidence does There's suggest... There's a diversion of, of museum views around the, the world. I, I, I hope I'm not misinterpreting your question, but there is a lot of evidence to suggest that um, engagement with the Holocaust does lead to a decrease in prejudice in general, not just in terms of prejudice against uh, people who are Jewish, but, but across the board. Um, so there was a big um, a, a Gandal sponsored a national survey uh, early this year um, that, um, that indicated that, um, that amongst Australians who had engaged in a study of the Holocaust, there was a, a correlative um, uh, increase in feelings of warmth towards other ethnic minorities uh, feelings of a uh, warmth towards Aboriginal Australians, that there, that there seem to be a causal connection, that as one studies the Holocaust, they, they gain a deeper understanding as to the humanity of, of different groups of people in general. So I think there is, a, there is a connection there. I think in recent years, we have all been witnessing uh, in Australia and around the world an increase in anti-Semitism. But I think it, it has been going hand in hand with an increase in racial vilification in general uh, and in uh, public displays of prejudice, uh, particularly in online spaces. Uh, and I'm, no, I'm not um, uh, equipped to be able to give reasons as to why this is the case, but it is a, a saddening and a worrying trend. And I think to come back to that point that I made about the place of Holocaust education, it shows that um, in terms of this making the Holocaust universal, that there will be work for us to do in the decades yet to come. Um, beyond the point at which we have living survivors to, to, to engage students, there will still be that engagement with students that will have, I think, continually a very positive effect um, as regards those general prejudices that they might otherwise, might otherwise have.